This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. The sixth book of the Bible, Joshua 9 through 11, Victory in Canaan. Israel has been released from bondage in Egypt, led by Moses through the desert for 40 long years. Finally, has entered the promised land of Canaan, which we know today as modern Israel. And we saw last week uh, some interesting examples of what to do and what not to do. They were told by God to take the first city, Jericho. They listened to God, did exactly what God said, and they were victorious. But then they were kind of prideful. They forgot to go to God. They figured, if we can do this, we'll take the next city, a little city called Ai. And um, they got defeated because they did not check with the Lord to get the game plan. And then they had to go to God after getting on their faces. And God said, now this is how you're going to do it. And he gave them deliverance. So we learned last week that you need to go to the Lord for everything. Even if you think you know how to do something, pray for wisdom. And we're going to see today that um, the lessons continue, and they're going to get fooled again. They're going to make the same mistake and not listen to the Lord when they should. They're not going to inquire of God. They're going to use their common sense, and common sense gets us into a lot of trouble sometimes. And then we're going to see how they get it right and how God really moves through this man Joshua. Joshua was the assistant to Moses. He was the commander of the armies that took care of the enemies. He is a brilliant general, a brilliant stratis, uh, stratis, uh, <laughs> fellow with strat what's the word? strategy uh, specialist. I'll work on that. And uh, he is able not only to handle things militarily, but he is also a mighty man of God, a spiritual man. Yet, like all of us, he forgets to go to God at times. So let's not forget to go to God. Let's ask for his help right now. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word. Help us to understand it and truly be changed by it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Strategist, that's the word I was thinking of. Okay, Sunday mornings, you've got to cut yourself a little slack, right? Chapter 9, Victory in Canaan. We're going to look at how Israel makes a treaty with the Gibeonites. God had said to Israel, Canaan is wicked. The people there are worshiping false gods, and if you don't destroy them, they will pollute you, you'll worship their gods, you'll fall, and you'll be destroyed. So anybody in Canaan, anybody in the land of Israel, you are to destroy. If they come from a far distance beyond that, you can simply make a treaty with them and coexist with them. But anybody in Canaan, you must kill. Well, that word got out. Got out to some very smart people who were very nearby. They were from Gibeah, the Gibeonites. We're going to see how the Gibeonites fool Israel. They lived only 20 miles away from the camp of the Israelites in a place called Gilgal. And they knew about that command of God to drive out all the inhabitants. We find that in Exodus 23. So they sent ambassadors seeking peace. And they claimed to come not from Canaan, but from a very far distant land. And so they deceived Israel, and Israel did not go to God for wisdom. So chapter 9 of Joshua, beginning in verse 1. It came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, in the hills and in the lowland and all the coasts of the great sea, that's the Mediterranean, toward Lebanon, the Hittite, Amorite, Canaanite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite, heard about it. They heard about Israel. They heard about how Israel was to destroy all the people in that land. And obviously they were afraid. So they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. Naturally, they're going to defend their own territory. So there's going to be a huge job for Joshua and Israel to destroy all these enemies. Verse 3, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, in other words, how they had defeated those two cities, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. They took old sacks on their donkeys, 
old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a far country, now therefore make a covenant or a treaty with us. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you dwell among us, so how can we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you and where do you come from? So they said to him, From a very far country your servants have come, because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. Therefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions for your journey and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants, now therefore make a covenant with us. This bread of ours we took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you. But now, look, it's dry and moldy. And these wineskins which we have filled were new, and see they're torn. These are our garments, and our sandals have become old because of the very long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. They did what you and I often do. They looked at the circumstances. They used their senses, their eyes, their uh, observation, their intelligence, and said, yeah, these things are old. Look at their bread. Look at their garments. They must have come from a very long way. Ambassadors seeking peace. Envoys. Envoys in those days did what envoys do today. If an envoy gets off the plane and goes to Washington, He or she is going to have to have something in hand. Something that indicates, I come from a certain country, letters of recommendation, seals, something to indicate who they are, some kind of proof. You and I have to show proof. You go someplace, you want to cash a check in your bank, you've got to have either a card, you've got to have a driver's license, some identification. They had that in those days. They had letters of uh, representation, recommendation, commission. They never asked. They never asked. They simply looked at the circumstances, looked at the clothing, looked at the food. They must be telling the truth. So this is now the second time that Joshua, who was not a young man, all those 40 years that Moses led them through the wilderness, Joshua was right there with him. He has to be a man of at least probably 80 years of age. He's not new. But he did not go to God and say, Wisdom, Lord, speak. He made that mistake by going after the second city, Ai, without asking God for counsel, and they got roundly defeated. He's made the same mistake again. We tend to fall into the same patterns of error and sin, don't we? And that's a very common one for us. We are really prone to do this in areas that we're familiar with. We all have specialties. We all do things at work that we know so well. We don't usually ask God for wisdom for those things. We ought to. Every day we ought to say, Lord, give me wisdom and understanding in things I don't understand and also and especially in things that I think I know so well that I might not want to come to you for. Very dangerous. So they didn't ask for God's wisdom. They just made a treaty with somebody who was local. And they violated the command of God to destroy those who are local because they will destroy you. All right? Let's see how long it takes for them to find out their mistake. Verse 16. It happened at the end of three days, that didn't take long, after they had made a covenant with them that they heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt nearby. Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to their cities on the third day, and their cities were Gibeon, Shipporah, Baroth, Kirjath, Jarim. So they wanted to check out these cities with these people that we had just become uh, partners with, so to speak. Remember, when you made a covenant with somebody, That meant that we're going to take care of you and you're going to take care of us. Kind of like a marriage with a man and a woman that they say, I'll be there for you. I'll take care of you in sickness and in health and what have you. So now they've got a marriage here with these people. 
They want to check it out and see who they are. Verse 18, but the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel and all the congregation complained against the rulers. They were supposed to destroy these people, but the rulers, Joshua in particular, had made a covenant. And now the people were upset with the rulers and rightly so. We have a right to be upset with our rulers. We do not have a right to badmouth them or trash them. We are to pray for them, and we can certainly responsibly uh, assent or dissent from their ad attitudes, and their, we have all sorts of vehicles to do that. And so responsible dissent is permissible, and uh, they're unhappy. So the rulers said to the congregation, We have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. And that's true. They made a mistake by not going to God to find out who these people really were. But now, having made a treaty with them, a treaty that was not only representing Israel's commitment, but God's commitment to these people, now to break that covenant would be to dishonor God. So they can't do that. That would make matters even worse. So this is what we're going to do. Verse 20, we will let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. Remember, God says when you make an oath, you keep it, right? And the ruler said to them, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for all the congregation, as the rulers had promised them. All right? They'll be servants. They're going to be slaves. They'll have to carry wood. They'll have to carry water. And uh, here's the beauty about God. We all make mistakes. And yet God is merciful and gracious. And even out of our mistakes, God begins to work good. All things can work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So God's going to take these heathen, pagan Gibeonites, make them carry the wood and the water to the tabernacle where they are worshiping the Lord God, Jehovah, where the praise and the worship and the sacrifices are going forth. They're going to have to hang around the house of God and hopefully come to know God for themselves. So look for an opportunity, even in difficult and disastrous cases, for God to work something good, to bring that person to the Lord or to work good in his life in some fashion. So things aren't going to be totally lost. So verse 22, Joshua called for them. He spoke to them saying, why have you deceived us? You said we are very far from you when you dwell actually near us. Now therefore you are cursed and none of you shall be freed from being slaves woodcutters, water carriers for the house of my God. So they really wanted to be free. They wanted to stay alive. They are alive, but they're not free. And so they didn't really get what they wanted. And Israel now is going to have problems because they're going to have to take care of these people and they're going to have to come to their defense. We're going to see that shortly. And so when we don't do things God's way, it's a problem. And yet... With the sovereignty of God, he'll still work things around for his purpose for a blessing. Now, verse 24. So the Gibeonites answered Joshua and said, Because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land, to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you, therefore we were very much afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now here we are in your hands. Do with us as it seems good and right to do to us. So he did to them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel. So they did not kill them. And that day Joshua made them woodcutters, water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord in the place which he would choose even to this day. So we find here the strong lesson that we need to hear from God. We need to go to him and say, what's up, Lord? And uh, if you don't get an answer right away, you take your time. If you need an answer in a minute, God will give you an answer in a minute. If you don't need an answer in a minute, don't be expecting that answer so quickly. But take your time. And um, my grandfather used to say, sleep on it. Take some time. They could have said to these folks, um, I'll tell you what you do. We don't know who you are. We're going to go to our God. We're going to pray about it. You, you camp over here, you take your moldy bread, we'll give you some of our food here, and let's just chill. Let's relax. We're not going to move until we hear from God. That would have given quite a testimony to these people that 
we're waiting on God. And you and I should do the same thing. My natural nature is to be quick, impetuous, and how many mistakes I've made. And perhaps you have as well. And we need to slow down and wait upon God. And if it's not a day, then it's two days. If it's not two days, I've been waiting for some things all my life. I don't know about you. But when God says move, I'll move. Until then, I will wait. So, tough lesson. Chapter 10 now is going to talk about Israel has victory in the south. Um, they're going to have to take the land. They've already moved straight through Jericho, Ai, and they have defeated the enemies in the central part of their thrust. Now they're going to take a campaign and move down to the south, and then they're going to move north to conquer the whole land. So we now begin to uh, move into the south. Uh, chapter 10, Gibeon is attacked. This is where the uh, Gibeonites, they just made a treaty with them, and now their neighbors, five kings, are mad at Gibeon because Gibeon has folded and surrendered to Israel. That weakens the position of the other nations. Remember now, these we call them nations. They're really cities that have kings over them. They're city-states. They're not actual countries, as we would know. But uh, these are independent city-states, and they're angry at Gibeon because Gibeon is no longer standing with them against Israel. So they're going to attack Gibeon. And the Israelites are going to have to defend Gibeah because they just made a treaty with them. So now they're going to have to really, uh, at night, have a very tough march uphill, uh, exhausted. They're going to have to come and defeat five, city, five different nations or city-states. Uh, the trouble we get into because we don't hear from God. We make commitments that we shouldn't make. And uh, we get into partnerships, we get into marriages, we get into relationships in church, in business, in government, when God didn't call for us to do it. Well, that's the bad news. We got into something we shouldn't have gotten into. But again, the grace of God. We are only a prayer away from God's healing. Forgive me, Lord, I was impetuous. Forgive me, I didn't hear from you. Now, help me, guide me, and get me out of this mess. So when you've scrambled your eggs because of self-will, God is the only one who can unscramble eggs. Not even your chef can do that, but he can unscramble eggs and make it right. So we've got a problem, but God's always got a solution. Chapter 10, it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and its king. So he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. So this really caused fear among these other kings. If Gibeon, the strongest of our cities, has folded and surrendered, what hope do we have? So, verse 3, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, king of Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, Eglon, they gathered together and went up they and all their armies encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Wow. Joshua must be thinking, what a big mistake I made. Not only did I foolishly believe these people were from a far land when they were local, got us to make a commitment to them. Now we are bound to them and must defend them. And now they've got five kings and their city-states coming against them. We've got to fight all of them. That's the bad news. From man's perspective, it's much worse than we had planned because all they did was take Jericho, one city, and then Ai, another city. Now they're going to have to have five forces against them. It seems worse, but God always has the right perspective because God is going to say, instead of taking those five cities individually, I'll bring them all to you. You take care of them all at once. So for those who are in the time motion study, you knock down five in the same time it takes to knock down one. So always look to God, even when things are turning bad. 
He's got a plan. He has a purpose. So let's see how they're going to handle this. Verse 6, the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. So the Gibeonites did not lose Joshua's telephone number, did he? How many times have I wished they'd lose my telephone number when somebody's in trouble? Don't call me. Call that pastor down the street. But uh, when somebody calls you, God's got a, a plan for it. Let him use you. It's not your problem. You just go to God and say, how do you want to handle it? It's not Joshua's problem. Lord, we made a mistake. We're sorry. We repent. But now we must take care of Gibeah. Help us. So Joshua ascended. And incidentally, this was a 4,000-foot ascent to be done by an army at night. With torches? Maybe. Doubtful. If I were the commander, I wouldn't want torches, would you? As tough as it is to see in the dark, torches for a large army can announce your coming. So they probably went up there at night in the dark, unless there was a moon. So he ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So there's that assurance. God is telling him, I'll be with you. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. Now, a lesser man or a woman wouldn't get up the next day. They'd get all depressed. They would just say, I just can't hear from God. Life's too tough. But Joshua's making his mistakes, and he's asking God's forgiveness, and he's getting up the next day, and he's moving forward. And uh, I hate to call this a gift, but I think of all the gifts we might have as Christians, the greatest gift is the gift of getting up the next day and getting right to it. You know, the devil might knock you down five times, but you just keep getting back up again, and he can't stop that. So I don't care how many times you've been knocked down, you get right back up and say, Lord, use me, and he'll continue to use you. We all get our teeth kicked in now and then, don't we? But we just keep on going, and the devil can't stop that. So he gets right back up there, and uh, he's going to take his army. He's going to go uphill on this 4,000-foot ascent to this city, and uh, he'll take his army at night. They're going to arrive probably either at night or at daybreak, exhausted, ready to fight five nations. Verse 9, Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. Ah, but we forgot the secret ingredient, the Lord. Look at verse 10. The Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Azekah and Makedah. God is the one who is in this battle. The victory is his, not ours. And the battle is his, not ours. It happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Haran that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Isn't that marvelous? We're going to see this again with Israel time and time again. There'll be times that God's going to use them against a great enemy. Israel comes up to that enemy and, oh dear, finds they're already dead. God already took care of it. He goes before you. Notice the past tense where God said in verse 8, I have delivered them into your hand. Past tense. They haven't even gotten to the enemy yet. They haven't even thrown a spear, shot an arrow. It's already done. It's already done. When you and I move in faith and know God's promises, the battle's already won. The victory's won. And so Joshua comes upon them. They are routed. And then verse 12, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel and said in the sight of Israel. Now, they marched all night and they got on the scene either at night or early morning. Five nations they have to, to battle. Huge number of people. The morning is wearing on. It's about noon. He knows the sun's going to go down in a matter of six or seven hours. He can't get the job done. Too many people, not enough time. What does he do? Man of faith? Oh, he's failed. But he's repented, and he's a man of God. And so he says, 
Sun stands still over Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Joshua? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that, before it or after that, that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp at Gilgal. Whoa! Marched all night, started attacking the enemy about daybreak, about noontime realized they couldn't get the job done, and so he commanded. He didn't ask God, he just simply commanded in the name of God, sun stand still over Gibeon, moon in the valley of Ajalon. And suddenly, the day froze. And the day moved from noon until evening in over 24 hours. So that day lasted 48 hours, gave them time to destroy their enemies. Amazing. And incidentally, there are records in annals of history of peoples, even as far as Aztec Indians and otherwise, this mysterious 48 hours of one day. So what happened is God just began to slow that rotation of the earth around the sun, just slowly began to make it crawl, gave them all the time they needed to defeat their enemies. Now, we might not get the sun to stand still for us, but again, as far as time, you don't have time, God will make time. God will make time for you. My late father was a judge. He was associate pastor here, Pastor Morton, and he was... Uh, heading to Kingston where he was on the bench to uh, try some cases on a given day. And he was always a man who was five minutes early, punctual as could be. But this one day some things happened that were really beyond his control. He got a late start and uh, this from Albany to Kingston takes us how long to get there? About an hour and, and a half maybe? And he had like 20 minutes. Now this man was as honest as the day is long because you wouldn't believe it otherwise. But he prayed. He got behind the wheel on his house in South Main Avenue and said, Father, I need to be there, and I need to be there in 20 minutes. And I'm going to go the speed limit, and I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'm going to leave it in your hands. He just got behind that wheel. He just did his whatever the speed limit was. He got there, and he couldn't believe it. He was coming along the street, and he looked at his, clock, his watch, and he was right on time. He had done an hour and a half in 20 minutes, whereupon a young girl walked out in front of his car as he'd gotten his eyes off the road and onto his watch. He didn't see her. She was right in front of his car. He said, Jesus. And he went forward and she wasn't there. He looked back. She was walking right across the street. Somehow she had been transported over that car. Crazy. If you hadn't known Pastor Mort, you wouldn't believe that story. But an hour and a half and 20 minutes and a little girl seemed to almost walk through the car or whatever she did to get to the other side. Our God is a great God. The name of Jesus will produce miracles. Don't ever, ever give up. You haven't got enough time? Tell God to make you time. He'll find a way to get the job done. And how many times have I had to say, Lord, not enough time, and he's shown me how to have shortcuts or to get an extension of time. Whatever it is, that's God's problem. As you listen to him, when the battle is his, he'll give you the victory. Well, now he has to take care of the kings. Verse 16, these five kings had fled and hidden themselves in a cave at Makedah. So as they're killing the people, the kings are jumping ship. They're not going to stand there till the end, and they're hiding. So it was told Joshua, the five kings have found, been found hidden in the cave at Makedah. So Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. And do not stay there yourselves, but pursue your enemies and attack their rear guard. Do not allow them to enter their cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. Then it happened while Joshua and the children of Israel made an end of slaying them with very great slaughter till they had finished, that those who escaped entered fortified cities. And all the people returned to the camp, to Joshua at Makedah, in peace. No one moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Again, we see how bright and brilliant a strategist our friend Joshua is. Now you would think that 
it's the most important to go for the king. If you get the king, you've defeated the people. Not always that case. Here we find that the five kings are hidden in a cave and the people are fleeing. Go after the kings and you lose the thousands of people. The kings are already contained. Roll a stone in front of that cave. They'll be there when we get back. Go after the people, destroy them, and again, let God show you the strategy of what needs to be done. We sometimes make mistakes by trying to figure, and we figure wrong. But he knows what to do. Leave the kings there. Let's get the people. We'll then come back and take care of the kings. Verse 22, Joshua said, Now open the mouth of the cave. Bring out those five kings to me from the cave. And they did so. And they brought out those five kings to him from the cave, the king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. And they brought out those kings, and Joshua called for the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who sent, or went with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks. That was a very common symbol in those days of saying, We are over you, we have authority over you. So Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid nor dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Didn't God say those very words to Joshua? Don't be afraid, be strong, be of good courage. He then passed it on down to his generals. Even as you and I learn from the Lord, from his word, to be strong and have courage, then we teach our children that. We teach those we're responsible for. We pass it on down to them. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For this is what the Lord's going to do to your enemies. And we can say that in our lives today. Our enemies, not people that we're fighting against, but we're fighting against flesh and, and the old nature. We're fighting against disease. We're fighting against the devil and all the attitude of the world apart from Christ. Let the Lord be the one who shows us how to be strong. And then afterward, Joshua struck these kings and he killed them and he hanged them on five trees. I think these generals, these leaders, needed the strong leadership of our friend Joshua at this time because they probably hadn't had this experience up until now of kings and of putting their feet on their necks and having to kill them. They had defeated the king of Ai and also of Jericho, but they still were new and green about this matter of war. And war is tough. If you were ever in the army, it was not easy. They had to learn how to kill. But you had to learn how to do that because either you kill or you are killed. And we had to be, I had to be trained in the army to do this in Vietnam and elsewhere. Uh, and it's not easy to be trained. I never had to kill anybody, but I had to run for my share of the rockets. But um, you have to learn to do it. And if the opportunity presents itself, you're going to have to go forward. And so he teaches them and he does it by example. A leader who will not lead and will not do it by example is not worth being a leader. And we've had leaders like that in the past who say, go out and do so and so, and they're not willing to stand and do it themselves. And so um, it's, we need to be able to be willing to do whatever we're asking someone else to do. And that's important in leadership, not always in terms of something like killing somebody, but even in the church. I thank God that I had a chance to start this church back in uh, 30 plus years ago with some dear people and every job I had to learn myself from cleaning toilets to screwing light bulbs in to whatever and when you learn to do something then you can give direction compassionately uh, to someone else please do this please do that and if they don't do it you do it yourself so uh, Joshua struck these kings and he hanged them on the trees until evening he had to take them off the trees at night because the Word of God said that we are not to leave a body on the, tr on the tree overnight. It is a curse on the land. And that's why Jesus had to be taken down off of the cross before dark because it would be a curse on the land and it could not violate the law. So at the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded, they took them down from the trees, cast them into the cave where they'd been hidden, laid large stones against the cave's mouth, and there they are to this day. Now um, he's going to move into the Southland to destroy that. On that day Joshua took Machedah, struck it, and its kings with the edge of the sword, utterly destroyed them, all the people who were in it. He let none remain. He also did to the king of Machedah as he had done to the king of Jericho. 
Now he's going to pass, verse 29, from Machedah, all Israel with him, to Libna. They fought against Libna. And the Lord also delivered its king into the hand of Israel. Now they're really moving. And one city after another is falling because God is in it. When God is moving in your life, all the obstacles will fall. The Lord delivered, verse 30, its king into the hand of Israel, struck it, all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword. He let none remain, but did to them as he had done to the king of Jericho. He went to Libna, in verse 31, did the same thing there. Delivered Lachish, verse 32, uh, and then Horam, in verse 33. So one after another, they're falling because of God's being with Joshua and Israel. Verse 34, from Lachish, Joshua passed to Eglon, and all Israel with him. They encamped against it, fought against it, and they took it on that day and struck it with the edge of the sword. Now, verse 36, he went up to Eglon, did the same thing there, struck the people, the king, the cities, left none remaining. They're being obedient to do what God tells them to do. Now, they had failed by being fooled by the Gibeonites, but they've learned their lesson and they keep on going. And again, that's a key in the Christian life because if we get caught up with past failures, we begin to focus on them, we get into depression. I deal a lot with the people in this area where they just focus on the past, they can't get past uh, what's going on, and we all get tempted. We all get tempted to think about the past. I fell into a little pity party this week. Can you imagine that? And uh, I began to, I was texting somebody about this, and I said, I'm unhappy about this, and I think my life's been tough, and, and I was expecting a little bit of care, and I got back this text saying, stop being a baby. You've had a good life. Praise the Lord. And then the scriptures come, which I didn't want to read. Rejoice in the Lord always, and God loves you, and praise his name, etc." And I just didn't want to answer, so I just fussed and fumed for about 20 minutes, and then I finally had to say, you're right. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, etc." Pity party. But don't focus on the past. The devil's trying to just bring that back up again. Forgetting those things that are behind and looking forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You learn that in athletics, you learn that in life. You make mistakes, you fail. You get up, you dust yourself off, and you start all over again. So they're doing great. They're, they're trusting in the Lord. Verse 38, Joshua returned with all Israel to Debir. They fought against it, took it, left none remaining, same thing. Verse 40, Joshua conquered all the land, the mountain country, the south, the lowland, the wilderness slopes, all their kings. He left none remaining, utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. And Joshua conquered from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza. He's in the real southern part of Israel here. And all the country of Goshen, even as far as Gibeon. All these kings, their land, Joshua took at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel, and Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. So what seemed like a horrible situation with five nations coming against them turned out to be a wonderful blessing. It just was much less work, and we're going to see that again. When a lot of enemies come against you, praise God. God's going to take them all down at one time and save you some time and motion. Now we've got to go to the north, the northern part of Israel. They need to be conquered. Uh, verse 11. You see how this is a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a land of blessing, but it's a land of work. A lot of the hymn writers and gospel song writers talk about Canaan land being heaven. Nonsense. Canaan land is a life in the spirit here on earth where there are giants and there are battles and there are victories. Now, the uh, heaven is, is not Canaan. Uh, there'll be no battles up there. There'll be nothing but uh, rest and peace in the Lord. But now we've got the north to conquer. And um, I, I want to give you a couple of lessons. We were, back in chapter 9, we talked about uh, the Gibeonites and how they fooled Israel. Uh, seek the counsel of God. Don't seek your senses. And um, in chapter 10, we just covered, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Jesus is the one who gives us the victory. And we need to be strong in that victory. So chapter 11 now. Uh, we find here a confederation of kings are going to gather again in the north. God's going to use the same tactic he used in the south. He's going to bring a bunch of kings at the same time against Israel to save Israel time. So they can just get all of them defeated at one time. Now, the first century historian Josephus had speculated that the army 
that came against them here in the north was 300,000 infantry soldiers, 10,000 cavalry troops, and 20,000 chariots. How many chariots and cavalry did Israel have? None. None at all. Maybe never even saw any. Well, Israel's going to defeat all their enemies. And let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 11. It came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard these things, he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, king of Shimron, and to the kings who were from the north in the mountains and the plains, in the lowlands, uh, to the Canaanites in the east and the west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, all these ites, right? And so they all went out and they, their, their armies, they gathered together as many as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude with very many horses and chariots. And when all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid because of them, for tomorrow about this time I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. So again, God is saying, don't be afraid. I'll be there with you. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. That seems kind of hard for animal lovers to hear that. Uh, but these horses, they had to have their tendons cut so they wouldn't be able to pull the chariots. That would disarm the armory, if you will. Um, it would not make them effective to be used by anybody else against Israel. Uh, also, probably these horses were used in pagan worship and was therefore part of the mandate from God to destroy all evidence of pagan worship. In any event, um, it was war and uh, horrible things are done during war. And uh, they had to make sure these horses and these chariots would not be used in the future. Joshua and all the people of the war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Merom. They attacked them. The Lord delivered from them into the hand of Israel. Uh, they were defeated. Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him, hamstrung the horses, burned the chariots with fire. Verse 10, Joshua turned back at that time and took Hazor, struck its king with a sword, um, struck all the people who were in the uh, city, all the cities of those kings and the, all their kings, he struck with the sword, uh, just being obedient to God's word. And uh, verse 14, the spoil of these cities, they took as booty for themselves, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them and left none breathing. Now, uh, we find here finally in verse 16 a summary of the conquests of what uh, was done by this man Joshua. He took all the land, the mountain country, the south, the land of Goshen, the lowland, the Jordan plain, the mountains of Israel, its lowlands, from Mount Halak to the ascent of Seir, even as far as Baal, God, in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. So the whole country he had reached, and he captured all their kings, struck them down, and killed them. And Joshua made war a long time with all these kings. Now, we've covered this all this morning, but it took him a long period of time to accomplish this. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel except the Hivites from Gibeon. They made that one mistake. They did not make it again. Again, an important Christian principle. You make a mistake, you ask God's forgiveness, and you don't do it again. So God had brought all these people against the Joshua. It was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, and that they might receive no mercy, but that he would destroy them as the Lord had commanded. Now God hardened their hearts. It doesn't mean that God made them come against Israel. They had hard hearts, but God affirmed that. He judicially affirmed in their hearts, that's the way you want it, that's the way it's going to be. So he simply hardened their already hardened hearts. At that time, Joshua came and cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, Debir, Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. None of the Anakim were left in the land of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. Too bad for that, because we can't get everything done, but those giants were tough. They were all defeated except the ones that got to these cities in what was later known for the Philistine area. The Anakim were what scared the nation 40 years earlier, or 38 years earlier. They were afraid to go in because of these giants. They were huge. 
and uh, yet here they're being destroyed right and left, but the work's not quite complete. Joshua had moved into all areas of the country, but uh, the, the part becomes the whole. He got the whole land, but there were still pockets where he couldn't destroy them, and they would then come back to haunt them. So there were still giants in um, these cities of Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. And they would have children who would have children who would have children who would have children who would have children until one day a really big guy named Goliath would come forth and almost destroy the whole nation single-handedly, calling forth for someone to come and fight him. And finally, a young shepherd boy by the name of David said, how should this man curse our God? And went out and felled that man with that slingshot and that stone. So anyway, if you don't get the enemies, they're going to come back to haunt you. And whatever God says to do to put something to death in your life, put, to, put this uh, sin, put this trait, put this characteristic, put it to death or it can come back to haunt you. Uh, but if it does, the victory of God is going to be there for you as well. God is so gracious. Verse 23, Joshua took the whole land according to all the Lord had said to Moses. And Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their divisions by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. So chapter 11, victories may take time, but through Jesus, they will come. Victory in Canaan, good lesson for our lives as well. Victory in Jesus is really our answer as that song goes. Uh, God says, seek my counsel. Don't use your own senses. Uh, sure, it looks good. Uh, it looks this way, but let me talk to you about it. Let me tell you what's really going on. Wisdom, Lord. Wisdom, what's really going on? Chapter 10, we are more than conquerors through Jesus, the one who loved us. And those victories are going to come, even if they take time. Wait upon the Lord. Amen? Let's bow our hearts before the Lord now. Father, we're grateful for this chance to have studied your word. We're going to ask in Jesus' name that you're going to help us to apply these principles, help us to seek counsel from you about all matters. If we are moving in the wrong direction, making the wrong assumptions, proceeding without your guidance, stop us. Help us now to know what's going on. And if we've made a mistake and we've scrambled the eggs, come and help us and unscramble those eggs and lead us righteously along your paths. Help us, Lord, to know that the victory is not ours, it's yours. You've already gone ahead. You've given the victory to Jesus. You've given him that victory at the cross over sin, sickness, death. And all we need to do is call upon the precious name of Jesus as our Savior and our Deliverer. And Lord, even if we are in the midst of a battle, and it seems like a long and difficult battle, we know that you're going to give us the victory even if it takes time, through Jesus, all of our needs are going to be met. Thank you that we have victory in Jesus. In your precious name, Lord, amen and amen.